about it. So everyone see that? Because I can't see you, so yell if you cannot. Um, so yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Emily. This is a, a great opportunity to sort of see a lot of old friends in Zoom boxes or names on the participant list and, and hopefully uh, make some new connections. So I, I, I'm going to talk about our work today on, on RPE regeneration. And, and, you know, as I was putting slides together, I realized this morning, you know, I think I can skip my first three or four slides for this group. I give a lot of talks in biology departments, so usually I go through the eye and why it's important, but I think we're, we're all pretty, uh, pretty sound here. Um, in our lab, we're, we're interested both in macular degeneration and sort of RPE diseases and also ganglion cell diseases like glaucoma and thinking about ways that we can um, sort of leverage some of the work we do, particularly with zebrafish models in, in understanding the disease process, understanding mechanisms, and then also hopefully using this to serve as a foundation for some therapies in the future. And I think everyone um, participating has probably seen versions of these charts where right, the, the uh, uh, number of blind and, and vision visually impaired uh, people in the US and worldwide are going up every year and we have very very few therapies for for these sorts of diseases so again we're kind of trying to think out of the box a little bit here using zebrafish to understand the disease processes and then hopefully uh, use that to develop some new therapies or serve as a foundation for others to develop new therapies so zebrafish are, are a really terrific model for a lot of aspects of, I think, eye development, eye disease, cell biology, and so forth. Not everything, but, but a lot of uh, uh, comparable areas to the human eye. So the morphology is relatively uh, similar. And you can see here on the left side, I have, this is just a cross section of an embryonic zebrafish eye. So you've got the retina, you've got the photoreceptor outer segments here, the retinal pigment epithelium, cornea, lens, light passing through. Um, as, as many of you know, if you've gone to any zebrafish talks, one of the things we love to do is show you movies of how tissues develop because the embryos are transparent and the larvae are transparent. So one can make transgenes and sort of look at cell movements, look at morphogenesis, look at cell-cell interactions and things like this. Um, and I think that's a really important attribute for a lot of the developmental biology work that's being done around the world. And then this aspect of regeneration is something that we've gotten interested in. So when I moved to Pitt, this was something we were sort of excited to start and, and start to think about um, both some of the great work that had already been done in retina regeneration and sort of putting our spin on some of that, but more so thinking about RPE regeneration where there wasn't a lot uh, known. So broadly, this is sort of what we're interested in in the lab. Uh, we still do some development work. We're looking at um, ganglion cell survival and, and zebrafish have this unique uh, aspect that they preserve their ganglion cells. We can actually cut the optic nerve and most of the ganglion cells live. So we're trying to understand how that happens to see if we could leverage any of that to preserve ganglion cells in diseases like glaucoma. We're looking at regeneration in the retina and the RPE. And then we've always sort of had this side interest in evolution. It's kind of my pet project in the summers. I like to go to Woods Hole and work on kind of crazy animals and, and think about how the eyes have evolved. So today, as I said, I'm going to focus on retina regeneration. And most importantly, I'm going to thank some people at the beginning and then try to call them out during the rest of the talk. So this project originally started with a uh, graduate student, Nick Hanavice in the lab, who got his PhD and sort of went on to a postdoc and now is an injury, uh, uh, in industry. Uh, and he worked with a great uh, student from Ireland, a postback, Kaylee Slater. That's kind of our early work. Uh, Lindsay Leach is a research scientist in the lab and worked with an undergrad who's now in optometry school, um, developing sort of an immune angle of this RPE regeneration. And then Feng Feng Lu is an MD PhD student, uh, sort of in a joint program with China that's kind of continued this work in regeneration. So I'm gonna sort of tell you each of their stories over the next 45 minutes or so. So the RPE is obviously an incredibly important tissue in the eye, and I've kind of summed that up here in one sentence, that it maintains functions for uh, keeping the photoreceptors happy. We know that there's the light absorption component with melanin granules and melanosomes, transport glial functions, phagocytosis, all these things that the RPE does are critically important. Our view of, of macular degeneration, or I know there's some, some controversy sometimes over this. I mean, we see this as, as kind of 
originating in the RPE. The RPE cells start to get sick. Um, they're unable to take care of the photoreceptors very well. The photoreceptors die. And then you have sort of this progression of disease. Again, there's really nothing that can be done right now. There's a lot of therapies that are being developed as far as transplant stem cell based things, but sort of none of this is yet in the clinic. And, and when we started this years ago, we wanted to think about regeneration and endogenous regeneration. So zebrafish are really good at regenerating tissue as are a lot of other um, sort of cold-blooded vertebrates in particular. And you know, there had been a lot done at the time from some really terrific labs around the world looking at retina regeneration, but nobody had really focused on the RPE. So when Nick joined the lab, he kind of did some historical research to look at what was known. And I'm you know, doing a poor job of summing that up here with seven bullet points, but you know, as far as what we could tell, you know, there, there are different studies and they all sort of show different things. They use different injury models. The readouts are slightly different, but, but kind of summing it up here, you know, if you have very small lesions in the RPE, the RPE cells can just sort of swell up, right? So if you lose a couple of RPE cells, this probably isn't that big of a deal. The adjacent ones get larger and they can compensate for that and take care of the photoreceptors. In other cases, RP cells can proliferate in response to sort of large or acute lesions. A lot of this is done through sodium iodate injections in mammals. Um, however, that proliferative response can be deleterious in cases like proliferative vitreoretinopathy, where you have these cells continuing to proliferate, migrating through the retina, and causing all sorts of uh, subsequent problems. In different models, in mice, rats, pigs, I think rabbits, um, peripheral RPE cells have been shown to proliferate at different degrees. Um, so, you know, during normal growth and or in injury cases, you can get some of these RPE cells that can proliferate. There's a lot known, there's really a fantastic literature in regeneration of RPE to retina transdifferentiation. So this is something I think the newt model and to some extent the chicken model have been really good at teaching us how RP cells can, can do some pretty amazing things, and that includes transdifferentiating to reform retina. But in most of these cases, RPE themselves do not um, reform, or you get a sort of a population of RPE cells that remain after a bunch of them turn in and regenerate a new retina, then these remaining cells would proliferate and generate a new RPE. But sort of what I would consider like a classic RPE to RPE regeneration system doesn't exist. There's this mouse model, the MRL and PJ mouse. This was developed as a lupus model, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct, uh, sort of an autoimmune system where there's an increased regenerative capacity and that includes the RPE. So if you do these uh, sort of low level sodium iodate uh, ablations, you can get RPE back in this model. And then Sally Temple's group has shown that uh, from human cadavers, maybe there's this population of RPE stem cells that have some sort of latent ability um, or hopefully it would have some sort of latent ability to regenerate. So when Nick started, this is kind of what we could find. And, and he asked a very simple question, and that was whether the RPE and zebrafish could regenerate. And this was the result of a really great collaboration with Brian Link and Ross Collery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where we developed a transgenic zebrafish line uh, using the enhancer for RPE 65A. And under control of that enhancer, we generated this fusion protein, NFSB and GFP. So NFSB is a bacterial nitroreductase protein. It's normally benign, so when you fuse it to GFP, you get this really nice label um, showing the RPE cells. You can start to see you know, the apical microvilli and so forth. But where NSFB is, is a, a, a terrific system for us is you can add a prodrug called metronidazole that's rapidly converted by this protein and causes apoptosis in cells that express the transgene. So if you've never looked at a zebrafish eye, I think you can appreciate here, this is six day post-fertilization. Again, one of these cross sections, nice retina, nice RPE. One day after we add the metronidazole, you can see that the RPE is fragmented. You're sort of getting these large blobs and the photoreceptor, this outer nuclear layer is already um, starting to degenerate. So this is a very rapid way to ablate the RPE or any cell type for that matter. Uh, in zebrafish and look at the effects. And certainly this is a sledgehammer approach, but it was a nice way for us to create these sort of large um, injuries and, and, and assess the responses. So here's kind of, I'm summing up about five years of Nick's work in one slide. Um, 
I'm sure he's not on the call, but he'd probably be a little offended if he heard this. Um, so he generated this model uh, and characterized it very thoroughly. What he showed was that ablation of the RPE leads to rapid death of first the RPE cells and then subsequently the photoreceptors. So sort of like we would see in the, in the cases of AMP. And then he sees a regenerative response. And this is driven by proliferation that peaks about three to four days after injury. So what we say post-injury, this is post-MTZ ablation using this nitroreductase system. And that these proliferative cells give rise to the new RPE. So we see this rapid proliferation, those proliferative, proliferative cells sort of generate the new RPE. And that happens in a peripheral to central matter. So the way our ablation works is we ablate the transgene, this RPE65 transgene is expressed in about the central two thirds of the eye. So we ablate these RPE cells, and then we see proliferative cells here in the periphery. Those proliferative cells then continue to divide and they give rise to new RPE moving in from the periphery to the center. So sort of almost like a wound healing response where these cells proliferate, divide, migrate, and move in and close up that gap with the very central most point being the last point that closed. Uh, we do most of these experiments in larval fish just for ease. We get hundreds of embryos. That's one of the great things with zebrafish. Um, so we do these mostly in larvae, but Nick repeated these experiments in adults and showed that adults in fact do regenerate as well in this sort of similar periphery to central way. It just takes a lot longer to do those experiments and our ends are lower. So we try to do most everything in the larva just where we can kind of go rapidly. So a big thing we don't know, and I always like to highlight this at the beginning of the talk, and that is, is what is the source of regenerated RPE? So if you're trained in developmental biology, lineage tracing is a classic experiment. The only way you can really show where cells come from, although with sequencing, I guess that's not the only way now, there are other ways to do this, but it's to do kind of these classic lineage tracing experiments where you label a cell and you look at where it comes from. Um, so we're working on this now, and our hypothesis is that it is these peripheral RPE cells that have been retained that end up giving rise to the new RPE. This is where we see proliferative cells. So we see them in this periphery um, and know that these are the cells that give rise uh, to the RPE, but we don't know where these come from. The hypothesis is that they're RPE derived, but we haven't shown that. And I think it's an important caveat to all of our experiments. There are alternatives. Uh, Mueller glia are known to give rise to all of the retinal tissue during retina regeneration. In no cases have they ever been shown to give rise to RPE, and our preliminary lineage tracing, we've not detected any case where we label a Mueller glial cell and see it uh, generating RPE cells. So I think this is unlikely, but it's formally possible until we increase our ends. Alternatively, there's this cell population in the periphery of the retina called the ciliary marginal zone. Um, this is found in teleosts, this is found in frogs. These animals sort of have indeterminate growth, so they'll keep growing um, based on resources, and the retina and the eye have to keep growing uh, consistent with the body. So the, the retina will, uh, both retina and RPE, new cells will come from these stem cell zones at the periphery. So it's possible that one of these CMZ cells maybe spins off a daughter cell that then moves into the RPE. This cell rapidly proliferates and generates new RPE. So we're generating lineage tracing constructs where we can label these cells and sort of test this model. Again, we think this is the most likely model, um, but I think we need to do some careful experiments to rule this option out. So that's sort of a caveat for the rest of the talk. Um, so what signals and pathways are important for RPE regeneration? This is where Lindsay Leach uh, got started, research scientists in the lab and sort of wanted to carry this forward and really get to the mechanisms. How is this process happening? So Lindsay did kind of a heroic experiment, at least for us at the time, where she dissected off uh, hundreds of these RPE65 expressing eyes, both in uninjured and injured cases, fact sorted them to isolate the RPE cells and then did RNA sequencing at a number of different time points to look at, you know, just kind of the hypothesis generating experiment, what's up, what's down, uh, can this give us some insight into the process? And as these experiments go, you get tons of data, you get tons of possibilities. And one of the things that Lindsay was particularly excited about from this kind of long list of, of potential genes um, was or uh, were components of the immune system, or particularly the innate immune system. I sort of always joke when I give this talk, for me, this was perhaps the worst possible outcome. 
of, of many, a long, somewhat long list of things I never wanted to study in the lab. The immune system was one of those, that it's just, it's complexity as a graduate student always scared me away. And as a, a, a PI, we've always sort of avoided this. So luckily I've always had people in my lab that don't listen to me, which is perhaps the best advice they can be given when they join. And Lindsay decided to kind of jump into this and start looking at the immune system. And I think what she's discovered has actually been really fun. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of literature um, in different systems. Here I'm highlighting mostly, if not all, zebrafish papers. Um, there's a particularly good paper from Jeff Mum at Johns Hopkins looking at the immune system during retinal regeneration. Um, so there's this sort of, it's an emergent theme, no longer emerging, um, that acute inflammation and resolution is really important in regeneration. And this is heart regeneration, liver regeneration, limb regeneration, really everywhere you're looking, this immune component is particularly important. And one uh, factoid that's important for, for the rest of the talk here is that we're doing these experiments again, kind of at these embryonic and larval stages, and zebrafish do not develop an adaptive immune response until about three to four weeks of development. So for all of our experiments, we're really just looking at the innate responses. Um, and this removes a little bit of the complexity. So zebrafish also have a somewhat primitive immune system that even these adaptive responses uh, are, are, some, are far less uh, mature than they are in mammalian systems or even in something like a frog. Um, but here we're focused on the, immune, uh, the innate immune components in, in our studies. Um, so this is a summary of what Lindsay did. I'm going to show you some of the data in a second, but I just want to give you the takeaway first. And that is uh, when we ablate, so these are cartoons of kind of whole eyes, right? So we're ablating again about the central two thirds of the RPE, these green cells. And we see this uh, significant influx of macrophages and microglia. Uh, that migrate into the eye after injury. This peaks at about three days after injury. Um, we don't see neutrophils. Uh, we know that inflammation is required for RPE regeneration, and this is kind of one of the central conclusions of her first study. Um, and then we think there's this process of resolution where the inflammatory response has to be uh, resolved, and that kind of balance, I think, in, in regenerative studies is what's really important, that you, you, know, you have to tip the balance to become pro-regenerative rather than causing additional problems that the infl inflammation would, uh, would uh, cause if it, if it uh, perdured. Um, so here's some of the data. So I'll start with these first two points. Um, shown here, you're looking at Again, kind of these dissected eyes. Top row are uninjured eyes, so MTZ minus. Uh, one, two, three, and four days after injury. And the injured samples are below, so you can see over time we're, we're losing these green GLA positive cells, again, due to this nitroreductase under the RP65 promoter. Um, and labeled in magenta is a uh, uh, what's called lysozyme tag RFP. So this marks neutrophils. So we're just here looking, you know, do we get cells kind of migrating into the injury site after injury? And in the case of neutrophils, we don't see them. We really, I think the maximum number of neutrophils we saw in an entire eye was six. And that is actually this eye. And in most cases, we saw far fewer. And in quantifying those data, there's, there's no significance. However, when we look at macrophages and microglia, we're staining those here with a uh, monoclonal antibody called 4C4 uh, that I just learned from Peter Hitchcock. There's a bioarchive paper that just came out. I think this is a galactin binding protein recognized by this uh, antibody. You see this massive increase in these 4C4 positive macrophages and microglia. And I'm referring to them always as macrophages and microglia. One of the unfortunate things in, in a lot of zebrafish studies is we don't have good antibodies. So really kind of carving out whether these are truly microglia or macrophages um, is very difficult. And in our experiments, we cannot do that. So we're sort of referring to them collectively as macrophages and microglia. But what you see is, um, again, in, in kind of the uninjured case here, you have this really nice ramified morphology of, of the cells. And then in the injured case, you kind of have these blobby looking things that as the macrophages and microglia ingest tissue and start to clear that out, they take on this amoeboid appearance. Um, so both morphologically and quantitatively, the numbers increase and they sort of have this active appearance in the injured eye. They're also you know, tightly associated with the injured RPE, just shown a couple of 
um, anecdotal examples here, um, some of which look like they've internalized some of the tissue. Again, not surprising, that's what these cells are supposed to do. So they're coming in and clearing out this injured tissue. But what I think is more exciting is then starting to think about um, how they're facilitating regeneration. And that gets to the sort of second part of the summary slide. And it's really that they're you know, regulating the inflammatory response. Um, so Lindsay tested this in a number of ways. And the first was just, again, kind of one of these sledgehammer experiments using dexamethasone, which is a, a sort of a potent corticosteroid, just to really squash the immune response. Um, this is not terribly specific, but it's kind of a nice, it was a nice first experiment. Um, so for all of our experiments, I'll sort of show timelines like this. So in this particular case, um, Lindsay pre-treated with dexamethasone for a day before the ablation and then measures out uh, several days after that. We do BRDU incorporation. So we look at whether proliferative cells are present or not and their numbers. And we also quantify the percent recovery of pigmentation. So basically how much of the RPE has grown back in that peripheral to central regeneration. Um, just shown here is a nice control with PXR. This is a, a, a target gene activated when dexamethasone is treated, just showing that the drug's getting in and it's doing what it's supposed to. Um, and you start to look at the data now for both the BRDU as a readout and the pigment recovery as a readout. We see in both cases, if we block inflammation with dexamethasone, we reduce the number of proliferative cells within the RPE and we reduce that pigment recovery. So this suggests that uh, immune and inflammatory suppression uh, is important for RPE regeneration. But again, it's kind of a sloppy experiment. So now when, when we sort of, when she got these preliminary data, we wanted to do this more carefully. And she did two subsequent experiments that I think really nicely make this point. The first uh, leverages one of the strengths of the zebrafish system. And that is there's a large, large, large number of labs and a large repository and generally really friendly people that are willing to share different mutant lines. Um, so there was a laboratory, uh, Celia Shaw at the University of North Carolina, who had identified uh, a mutation in a gene called IRF8. And this is very important for the maturation of macrophages and microglia. Um, and Celia had shown that these mutants lack microglia out to about 31 days, so about a month, and macrophages are deleted at least a week, and then some of them start to come back, but they're very, very immature cells. So we got this IRF8 mutant, we crossed our transgene into it, so our NFSB um, RP65 transgene, and then did these same experiments. So we have laid it in the IRF8 background. So shown here are a couple of examples, IRF8 wild types with MTZ, IRF8 mutant, homozygous mutant with MTZ. I'm just showing you two different examples here. Um, this is sort of a very severe example, and this is a somewhat more mild example of what happens. The first thing we noticed is in the absence of these macrophages and microglia, you get this accumulation of tunnel positive cells, both within the RPE and the photoreceptor layer that's dying because we lost these RPE cells. Um, and those data are quantified here. Um, basically for MTZ minus and MTZ plus IRF8 wild types and IRF8 mutants, you see the significant increase in tunnel positive cells when you don't have the macrophages and microglia present shown here. And just for comparison, again, this is our sort of our most severe case. We like to show the range in a lot of our experiments that I think, you know, the data are never as clean as the median or the average. So we try to show different examples. So this is point D and point B is here, which is closer to the sort of the, the, the common phenotype that we get from this. So then if we do those same experiments and we look at pigment recovery, in this case, I'm showing in the remaining here, we see a significant reduction. So again, if you don't have these macrophages and microglia, um, you're impairing RPE regeneration. So then she did this a third way, and that's using this inhibitor PLX3397, which depletes macrophages and microglia by blocking the CSF1R receptor. Uh, and what she sees is really, again, the same thing. You get this elevation of tunnel positive cells, particularly within the RPE as quantified here. So the cells aren't getting cleared because the macrophages and microglia are gone. And then when you look at the percent regeneration uh, shown here uh, for sort of the, the wild type case or the MTC plus case and the depleted case, um, you see this significant reduction. So taken together, these data support a model where inflammation is required for RPE regeneration, 
and likely kind of suggesting there's some sort of, again, this resolution phase where you have to tip the balance to become pro-regenerative rather than causing all these other problems that the inflammation would, uh, would lead to if left unchecked. So Lindsay then went on to basically isolate the macrophages and microglia under each of these conditions by fax using the MPEG and cherry transgenic line. And we've identified a number of um, cytokines and different factors. We haven't yet characterized any of those, but this is kind of one area where she's pursuing now is trying to understand the macrophage and microglia side of this. Really, what are they doing? What are they sending early in the injury response? What are they doing later in the injury response to start to parse out some of that cell-cell um, interaction between these immune cells and the, and the RP. Uh, sorry, here's some of those things. And these charts are somewhat meaningless to show until you really get down into the, the weeds of what each of the genes are. But this, I, I think this is sort of a future area where she's going to pursue some of this. And then as well, we're, we're kind of def, uh, uh, developing, you know, it's great doing these, I, I really strongly believe in doing in vivo experiments, that that's where you've got all the right tissues and they're arranged in the right way. We have a lot of different candidates. So Lindsay in parallel is, is kind of developing a human RPE culture system where we can start to you know, look quickly through some of these so we can trigger inflammation, we can stress out the RPEs, uh, the RPE cells, and look at how they behave. For instance, in a simple scratch assay, you know, are the cells migrating the right way? Are they proliferating and so forth? Just to maybe pre-screen some of the candidates that we then want to screen in vivo um, using our zebrafish model. So sort of in parallel, she's developing this. So while that was happening, um, you know, we, we still have the central question, and that is how the signaling is integrated into the damage and regenerating RPE. And we really wanted to, to sort of further, further uh, uh, delve into this again to start to get some of the me mechanisms underlying the regenerative response. And this is where Feng Feng Lu, this talented MD PhD student in the lab, joined the lab. And we kind of took in parallel to the unbiased screening approach, we took a, sort of just the classic hypothesis driven approach. Um, and looked at mTOR signaling as, as a potential mediator of this, right? So mTOR is very well known to function in the RPE, in the eye. It's known, right? It integrates a number of signaling pathways to regulate proliferation. So sort of all sorts of biology interface through mTOR. So for a number of reasons, we thought this would be a good candidate. And one of those reasons was that it had already been shown in nucleoglia to be required for uh, uh, retina regeneration. So there's some really kind of nice classic work from Andy Fisher's lab and Chick um, showing that mTOR is important for these new glia to respond to injury and generate uh, progenitor cells. And then also some more recent work in zebrafish showing that mTOR is required um, downstream of some sort of microglia macrophage drive signal to trigger this dedifferentiation and progenitor cell formation of the glia. And in addition, mTOR is known to be involved in axon regeneration in retinal ganglion cells and a number of other regenerative responses. We thought this would be a good candidate and Feng Feng start to sort of started to delve into this. So the first question is, is mTOR in fact activated after injury in the RPE? So we use this readout, the ribosomal protein phosphor S6, which gets activated uh, as the mTOR pathway, particularly mTOR C1 gets activated. So Feng Feng did this very careful time course from three hours after injury up to four days post-injury and looked at whether uh, stained in magenta here, this phospho S6 appears within the RPE. And in fact, it does when she quantifies these data. This is just for the RPE signal. Um, she sees a significant increase at about six hours after injury. And that lasts out to about three days. So it's sort of this long signal that appears in the RPE. It kind of plateaus, but it stays on within the RPE out for three days. And of course, she also sees these a little light on my screen. I don't know how they look for you, but she sees uh, mTOR, phosphorus 6 activity within the glial cells as well, again, which makes sense given their this sort of known role during retina regeneration. So to start to look at function, she first took advantage of a couple of pharmacological inhibitors, uh, rapamycin and INK128, which are both kind of well-known inhibitors of mTOR signaling. Um, same sort of paradigm, we pre-treat with the, in, uh, the inhibitor for about a day before we do the ablation, and then we carry out the, 
embryos for a few days, do BRDU incorporation assays, to look at proliferative cells within the RPE, and then look at RPE recovery through pigmentation or GFP. Um, just to show the drugs work, Fung Fung utilized again this phosphorus 6 and shows when she treats with each of the drugs. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the concentrations up here, up there, right up here. Um, treats with both of the drugs. She essentially eliminates that mTOR uh, activity, uh, PS6 staining within the RPE, as well as the retinas, as shown the set of drugs are working. And then when she carries out the experiment, um, for both of the drugs, she sees a significant reduction in proliferative cells within the RPE layer and a significant reduction of pigmentation. Uh, so the RPE isn't recovering as well. You'll notice that these eyes are smaller and we've done a few experiments, kind of more developmental experiments. Um, and it appears as though mTOR signaling is also required in the ciliary marginal zone cells. Again, these stem cells that allow the retina to grow. And when we do these longer term inhibitions uh, of mTOR signaling, these cells actually proliferate a lot, but it's probably not differentiating into into new neurons. And this is consistent with some work uh, in Xenopus in particular, where that's been, uh, that's been suggested. So to test this in a parallel way, I mean, I think these drug studies are nice, but it's again, really helpful uh, in the zebrafish field where you can often get these different mutant lines that are available. So there was a retroviral insertional mutant into the mTOR locus that causes a premature stop codon and truncates the protein by about 60%. Um, so we're able to get this line, cross it back into our ablation paradigm. Um, when Feng Feng looks at phosphatex 6 staining, so she again sees a significant decrease within the RPE, suggesting that this mTOR allele is in fact a loss of function allele. And she also sees reduction in proliferation and a reduction in RPE regeneration, indicating that mTOR activity is required for, for the RPE to regenerate. There's also a compound that um, called MHY1485 that, as I understand it, it sort of um, uh, plays with autophagy a little bit. And, and mTOR is well known to function in, in, in autophagy and autophagy flux. Um, so there's this drug that, that sort of stimulates mTOR activity um, by modulating that, that flux. Um, so we, we obtained this and did the same sort of experiment pre-treat for a day for a couple days out. And what Feng Feng actually found is this does in fact increase mTOR activity. So you see elevated phosphatex 6 staining within the RPE and you actually see enhanced regeneration. So if we look out um, at two or three days post injury um, relative to sort of the normal case, um, the normal injury case, we see significantly more BRD positive cells within the RPE and a more recovery at the same time in these uh, MHY1485 treated uh, larva. So this is kind of interesting. It, I won't say it's sufficient for RPE regeneration, but I think it can enhance the process a little bit. Um, so how does it do this? We went back to kind of the tried and true RNA-seq experiments. So Fang Fang isolated these GFP positive cells out of the injured and uninjured eyes, plus or minus rapamycin, did RNA-seq. And of course, we got you know, lots of different things and our old friends, the innate immune system and immune system components were amongst the um, pathways that were upregulated. So we saw this is just a subset of the genes, but these genes are of course upregulated in the injury site. These are sort of all immune related things. And then when we treat with rapamycin, they're, they're uh, uh, go down. Um, so suggesting that- no. Hello. Um, so the, the next question we asked was uh, whether mTOR facilitates macrophage and microglial recruitment into the injured eye. And there's some literature suggesting that there's this interplay between mTOR and, and the immune system. So Feng Feng treated with rapamycin um, to block mTOR signaling, and then using, in this case, a transgene, an MPEG-1 M cherry transgene that stains the macrophage, or, or is expressed, I should say, in the macrophage and the microglia, um, she was able to show that, in fact, if you block mTOR signaling with rapamycin, you get this significant reduction in infiltration of macrophages and microglia into the injured RPE. 
It's not that simple though, and this is kind of an area of ongoing work or sort of ongoing thought in the lab, uh, because we see mTOR, not surprisingly, is also activated within the macrophages and microglia themselves. So hopefully you can see that here, particularly in these blowups. So this is M cherry now in yellow and phosphorus six, the mTOR activity marker in magenta, there's overlap between these two. So the macrophages and microglia are also expressing mTOR themselves. So we wanted to ask a question of what would happen if we remove these cells? Um, do we still see mTOR activity within the RPD? So to do that, Feng Feng treated with this PLX3397. Again, this is the easy way. This is a CSF1R uh, blocker. It prevents the maturation, so you can sort of deplete these cell types. Um, she, she, of course, sees a loss of macrophages and microglia, shown here in the M cherry stain. Uh, but there's also a reduction in mTOR activity within the RPD. So together, these data suggest that the macro, so mTOR is sort of required to help, you know, stimulate the influx of these macrophages and microglia within to the RPD, but then mTOR signaling within the macrophages and microglia themselves also somehow facilitate the maintenance of mTOR in the regenerating RPD. So the signal, as I said at the beginning, it's this really long signal out to three days of injury where we see significant elevation. And we think these macrophages or microglia are sort of helping to keep that um, going. And, and why they do that is an outstanding question. So this is a model, and this is sort of a work in progress. And, and I think I just summed it up there. You injure the RPE. There are different signals right? that, that are, are, are sent. Um, it's mTOR dependent within the RPE cells that's sending signals to recruit the macrophages and microglia. Um, we think these are somehow non-inflammatory because if we treat with dexamethasone, we don't block this. Uh, but then the macrophages and microglia also uh, have mTOR elevated in the injured state, and that's somehow reinforcing the mTOR activity within the RPE cells. So we've got this feedback loop happening between two tissues or two cell types. So here's sort of a, a list of ongoing work um, of some of the things we're still doing for this RPE project. Again, as I highlighted at the beginning, this is a critical experiment, uh, lineage tracing of the regenerated RPEs. We have to know where these cells are coming from. As I said, Lindsay has identified a number of cytokines and receptors, both through her RPE RNA sequencing and her macrophage and microglia RPE sequencing. Um, so we're trying to start to look at some of those, both pairs, cognate pairs, and individual components to understand what's happening there. Um, we've kind of been slowly developing single cell RNA sequencing. We've, at least in our lab, had a hell of a time getting, you know, really good, high quality, viable cell populations for this that we're comfortable with sequencing. Um, but I think we're getting there for the, or gotten there for other tissue types, and, and we're sort of getting there for the RPE. And I think this will inform us of some of the biology in particular do we have you know, subtypes of cells is there some stem cell you know all these sorts of things we can start to, to, to look at um, but where we're really interested and in, i think you know our assays up to this point look at whether we have proliferative cells or not and they look at whether we get rpe back or not and we've, i think identified some of the components that, that lead to this and particularly this inflammatory and immune component mTOR somehow plays into that, but it's not really telling us how regeneration happens, right? How do these cells migrate in? How are they sort of moving to repair this damage? And I think that's particularly interesting and has, you know, some additional impact into thinking about how some of these RP sheets or stem cell transplants, how integration occurs, how do the regenerated RP integrate with photoreceptors um, that are regenerating, in this case, regenerating parallel, but what if they weren't uh, ablated at all. How does a, a unpolarized RPE cell repolarize and integrate? I think this system, we can start to ask and answer some of these questions. This is just a series of TEM images that Nick took kind of on one of these LARC experiments where he was doing some TEM anyway, and he noticed, I've kind of outlined it here through this stitching of images, but there was like this really long phylopodia, I don't know if you could call it a phylopodia at this point, um, it was sort of stretching from the injury adjacent pigmented area into the injury site and it has these little pigment granules in it, almost like the RPE at the injury edge were sort of feeling into the center for something. I know I'm 
supposing a lot with that statement. But this sort of excited us, right? These sort of you know cell-cell interactions and real cell biology. Um, that we're starting to think about ways that we can um, we can address. And then you know other factors in RPE regeneration. Um, so through these RNA sequencing screens, right, we get you know 100 things up, 100 things down. How do we start to look at these in a meaningful way? Well, one I outlined is potentially developing this human RPE culture system. But another in parallel is it's now really easy in zebrafish to do these F0, meaning injectable uh, CRISPR screens, where you can generate a number of non-overlapping guide RNAs. And it's been shown from a few studies, there are a couple other ones than, than this that I'm showing, um, that if you generate synthetic, and particularly this is important, synthetic guide RNAs, you just get them from a company, um, and target three different non-overlapping areas of a gene, you know, almost up to 100% efficacy, uh, we can get mutations in this gene and, and knock it out. Shown here is kind of zebrafish people always show tyrosinase as their example, so they can get non-pigmented patches. And in this case, it's the eye. Um, but this system works really well to get these biallelic F0, you know, knockouts or mutations is probably a better way to say it. So we kind of combed through our, our RNA sequencing data, and I, I won't say we did this in a completely unbiased way, but it's a bit cherry picking of things that were, you know, the most downregulated, um, and in different classes where zebrafish, there's a genome duplication, so you often have paralogs, uh, so an A copy and a B copy, which complicates um, to some extent studying them. Um, so we sort of went into our, our data and picked out, uh, I think there are 27 candidates that we wanted to screen through in this CRISPR-based F0 screen just to see if this would work and then maybe scale it up. And they kind of fall into a few different um, predicted functional classes in addition to this miscellaneous group that I just needed another color and I couldn't do one at a time. So they kind of got grouped together in this orangish color. Um, so Fang Fang, has gone through now and, and developed a system where she can very quickly inject three guide RNAs. She grows these up, so she injects it into our RP65 and FSB background, grows these up, does the ablation and screens them. Um, we test each of the guide RNAs individually, so we show that they're highly mutagenic on their own. And then what Fang Fang does is when she injects all three of them, we actually screen in most cases, we get these really large deletions. So either the here to here gets deleted or here to here or here to here. So we screen for embryos that have these large deletions. And I think out of the 27, it's something like 20 or 21 of them. You know, we have now all the embryos we assay are ones that have these big deletions, which either removes such a large chunk of the gene that the protein is not functional or causes a frame shift. Um, sometimes the RNA can get degraded. You know, all these sorts of things. So we think these are more similar to a knockout than looking at missense mutations that may, may or may not affect the protein in a way that, that we, uh, we hope here to just kind of squash its function. So she genotypes some of these, pull out the ones, genotypes the tails, pulls out the ones that are good, and then analyzes the heads for RPE recovery. And then here, there's a really great collaboration between Lindsay and Birch Fisher, who is a, uh, I hope it's a does like, you know, satellite imaging and you know, quantifying river growth or erosion and things like this. But basically he was able to write us a MATLAB script where instead of the way we used to do this is we would measure individually uh, each embryo or each section of each embryo to quantify regeneration. We now have this really nice uh, Fiji-based program where we can just go in and in every image uh, import the image basically process it into getting pixel intensity values that then spit out as a heat map of pixel intensity where we can quantify every single section we take um, and look at, at RPE regeneration. And we sort of get plots like this that then we can do very rigorous statistics on and find either regions of the RPE where regeneration is impaired or enhanced or subregions within the RPE. So what we've kind of set as a criteria yeah. for this particular screen is we look for about 20 degrees of continuous uh, statistically significant difference between RPE regeneration as assayed by this pigment recovery um, 
And we sort of call those putative positives that then go to follow up. And this is a nice example here. This is IWR1 inhibition. So this blocks wind signaling. You see this really significant difference between the IWR1 treated and the DMSO control treated, where this is sort of the quantitative difference in pigmentation um, across an angular distance of the eye. So we can sort of get a region and a quantitative difference, uh, again, over many, many animals and many sections per animal. Um, so in doing this, Fang Fang has now screened these 27 genes. Um, I should say these 27 came out. Again, these were all downregulated. Um, uh, I'm sorry, upregulated in, in the injured eye. Um, basically nine of them seem to uh, uh, impair RPE regeneration. So these are putative positive regulators. So I don't have them in classes here, cloud and uh, interleukins, things like this. We found seven of these that are putative negative regulators. So actually the, there are regions of the RPE that are more pigmented or more recovered. Um, they're, they're control counterparts. Um, they fall into these different categories, so perhaps they're somehow negative re regulating the process. And then the other 11, there were no phenotype. Um, but again, I think the caveat for this assay is that we're only looking at pigmentation. Um, we're only looking at pigment recovery. So when we actually look at the sections of those eyes that didn't show a quantitative difference here, some of them have very obvious morphological phenotypes. So they're large blobs of RPE that either haven't been cleared or aren't regenerating correctly. So again, kind of getting back to that cell biology, I think there's a lot to learn at how the RPE kind of come in and regenerate the tissue. And perhaps some of these candidates will do that. Or I think based on the, the quality of data in this quantitative approach that we have now, I think we can expand that screen a lot more and screen further into our gene sets um, or now in perturbation gene sets. So for example, when we treat with rapamycin, we have all these candidates start to knock them out and see what happens. Um, so that's sort of where we're headed. And again, this is the, the very old picture of the lab, but um, I tried to call out people as I went, but this project really started with um, Nick and Kaylee in a great collaboration with uh, Brian and Ross in Wisconsin. Uh, it was continued by Lindsay, who did the immune uh, uh, cell work, and then Fang Fang, who did the mTOR work and this CRISPR screen. And then Birch helped us with the questions, helped us. He developed the quantitative methods for this. Um, and of course, our funding sources. Uh, that really helped, especially at the very early stages of this, get, get some of this work done. Um, in particular, we worked at the Marine Biological Lab, we've done a lot of light sheet imaging of regeneration to start to image the cells. Um, so we had some fellowships to develop some light sheet uh, techniques there, particularly with Paul Maddox and Joel Smith. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know the easiest way to do this, but I'll, I'll stop sharing. And then if folks have questions, we can try to, try to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have my victim uh, for the final comments and questions, and today will be Brian Perkins. Uh, Brian, so be ready. You'll be the last one. Uh, let's start with Zach. Hi, Dr. Gross. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. <clears throat> so I had a quick question more about like uh, the biology of that RPE ablation and regeneration. Um, so when you ablate the mature R or maturing RPE and get this infiltration of newly developing RPE, um, do you basically get a kind of a resumption of normal RPE processes like retinoid cycling or kind of an interface with the photoreceptor, like developing photoreceptors? Yeah. So, so your question, I think, to, to perhaps rephrase a little bit is, uh, are the regenerating RPE differentiating properly and functioning properly like a normal? Yes, yes. Normal? And so kind of actually our... like transcriptomically profiling that. And we haven't that. done it at that detail, you know, transcriptomically, proteomically profiling. You mentioned that as one of your I, future directions. You know, by looking at the, the, the cells and the anatomy, we see resumption of people processes, they go down and surround the photoreceptors. And this particularly, if we look in the adults after injury, you see, you know, the RPE cells morphologically look very normal. That's the level at which I think I can answer your question. We haven't done any transcriptomics, any functional work. Um, that said, we know that the fish recover vision. Um, so we've tested them through some of the, 
you know, one could argue how how elegant the techniques are to sort of assay vision in zebrafish by just OKR, or OMR, or something like this, whether they're tracking, but the fish track normally and they recover vision very quickly. Um, so the photoreceptors are functional and the assumption there is they're functional because the RPE is also helping them. Um, but as far as retinoids, things like that, we haven't gotten into that very much. We're more of a, you know, I'd say a developmental lab in the sense that we're trying to understand the process, not the end product, but that doesn't take away the importance of your question. Thank you. All right, let's move on to web. Uh, Seth. Uh, hi, uh, great talk, Jeff. Um, so um, I was wondering if you've tried this in adults. We have. Um, so the adults regenerate as well. Um, we have not done the transcriptomics or any of the profiling from the adult RPE. That's all done from larva. But the adult RPE does regenerate uh, over the course of... I believe it's three weeks. Um, yeah. And again, you get the apical processes. So morphologically, the RPE cells look normal, but we haven't tested them functionally. Thank you. Yeah. OK, um, Professor Hall. Hi, that was really fun. Um, uh, I have a question about the Telios genome uh, duplication. Are, are any of the genes that you see duplicated uh, with varied function. I'm thinking about maybe getting into uh, trans, uh, referring to mammalian uh, lenses and so, uh, or retina and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I was worried when you said the genome that you were looking in the weeds <laughs> of genome duplication, which uh, is complex. Um, so we have a few paralogs. Well, I should say we have many that come up on the RNA sequencing. For this kind of initial screen, we avoided most of them for the reasons I think you're implying that you, know, you can have either duplicated and shared function or they've evolved unique functions. So to test whether our screen would work, we wanted to avoid those because we would likely have to knock out both of them to, to see a phenotype. There's one prostaglandin set that we put on there that's you know, highly associated with AMD that we were interested in. Um, and we only see a phenotype with one of the two. Um, but again, that's very preliminary. But I think now we can go further into the screening and it, you know, right, 30 or 40% of them are probably gonna have, each paralog has a unique function, the others are gonna be shared, but it's gonna be a case by case basis. I don't know if anyone's worked out the logic of that to predict shared versus unique functions. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Sara, you have a question there. Yes, thank you so much for the great talk, Jeff. Uh, my question is just regarding that I noticed the GFP signal does get dimmer in the RPE around the three to four days plus injury mark. I was wondering what was causing this dimming of the signal if the RPE itself is regenerating. So I, I think what you're probably referring to, so at the, the center, the RPE, right, those, those cells are being cleared out. So we've ablated the central two thirds. Those have been cleared out and it's these peripheral cells that are kind of coming in and regenerating, and there, as they differentiate, they're turning the RPE65 back on, right? So this is kind of a normal gene function that they need RPE65. And maybe this gets to the first question as well, that that's a differentiation uh, a component. So they're turning that back on and then the GFP is ramping back up as that happens. So I think probably what you're referring to is the dimming is not so much dimming, but actually ramping back up to get brighter as the cells move in as they uh, uh, begin to differentiate and sort of become more mature RPE. Uh, does that answer your question? Sort of, yes. Yeah. Uh, I just know in one of the uh, images that the, uh, when you could see the entire RPE, uh, I noticed that the three, like the, it almost looked like the two days post injury had uh, more GFP expression than the four day. So I was just wondering if that had something to do with like, uh, and also why you would use then the ZPR2 signal if that, that doesn't that just tag uh, RPE as well? Yeah, so, so two questions. I think the, the one part of your first why it sometimes looks brighter, I think you see clumping, right? As these GFP positive cells are being ablated, so as the metronidazole and the nitroductase are sort of taking effect, you often see clumping. That you sort of get these blobs of GFP, and those are going to be cleared away by the macrophages of microglia. So you do see these brighter but punctate areas, and that's kind of the dying tissue. Um, the ZPR2 is a monoclonal antibody we do use for staining. 
it's tough to use that for quantit. We don't like to use that for quantitation uh, very much. That so there's just some variability with it. Um, so we try to stick to the pigmentation and the uh, uh, just the GFP itself coming back on as much as possible. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's move to the room and then come back to the web. Uh, so Emma and Arun. Hi, Dr. Gross. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a, a quick question. I noticed in your uh, uh, Amtor, uh, how the Amtor pathway gets activated to show a heat map. And I noticed that you have also uh, big numbers, interesting numbers on the neutrophil degranulation and the small uh, molecules transport. Have you looked at those? What, what? We have not yet. As for the mTOR, the only thing we really did there related to the immune was what I showed of, of looking at macrophages and microglia. There, there are a number of those data, I believe, were two days post-injury. And when we look at four days post-injury, we actually see a lot of kind of interesting, you know, cell-cell communication type things, gap junctions, where maybe there's um, some involvement in, in sort of reestablishing these connections. Um, but we have not yet gotten to delve into that. Feng Fang, unfortunately, is graduating, so I need to recruit a new student to kind of go deeper into some of those lists. Sorry, that's not a very uh, enticing answer, but it's what I've got. Hello, my name is Iron Moon, working with Dr. Paul Chasky. Um, thank you so much for a great talk, because uh, your talk reminds me of my PhD study. I worked on the wound healing uh, you know, in in the skin. And then what you show here is very, very similar to the skin wound healing process. So what we see is, you know, after the uh, injury, the periphery of epithelium responds to the uh, cytokines and then they start migrating and then filling the gap. But then what I studied was actually the epithelium response to TGFA beta or wind signaling and they undergo epithelial mesenchymal transition. So the epithelium becomes a migratory mesenchymal um, epithelium so that they start filling up. So my question is, have you looked at any EMT in the periphery of RPE? And then also if it happens, do you expect to see any like a Madden chemo uh, EMT markers such as TGFB beta or wind signaling in the periphery of the uh, injury? So, so yeah, that's a, a great question. This is where I, I think that maybe poorly delivered cell biology pitch, this is where we're really trying to go is to understand what's happening at that interface between injured and uninjured tissue, how the cells are moving. So. I don't have a good answer for you as far as do we see EMT markers, do we see these sorts of things because we haven't you know, we haven't done the experiments carefully enough um, to look. We see some interesting cell behaviors at kind of the crude level we've looked so far at that interface, but nothing with a molecular mark or anything that would point to a pathway. We do know that Wnt signaling, at least Wnt activity, is required for regeneration. Um, so in in kind of Nick's early studies. Um, we blocked wind signaling and we know that that prevents the regenerative response. So that's actually our, one of our most potent, we kind of use that as a control now, um, like when we're training this data set to do the quantitation. Um, so wind is involved, but where and how and sort of what cells are, are sending signals, who's receiving signals, things like that, we don't yet have that level of resolution, but that's the, so that's the direction we're trying to go. No, I think it's really interesting. It's because um, in the during the screen window healing, when we were actually treating the pig skin with uh, drugs to facilitate this the epithelium um, migration, and then the uh, wound healing process was actually really accelerated. So actually, um, you know, kind of like a trying to bump up the, you know, for example, wind signaling, it might actually accelerate and uh, the regeneration of RPE. Yeah, I mean, although in our case, it, it seems to, well, I don't say wind signaling, but, but at least kind of crudely blocking the pathway blocks it completely. So I think there's, you know, there's going to be context dependent and tissue dependent roles here. And 
you know, we just need to be able to, we just need to more carefully look at this. And really, I think those interface cells, and this is where the single cell sequencing or even some of the spatial approaches would be really cool to understand what's happening at those different regions, you know, X number of cells away from the injury site to kind of understand that and start to parse it out. But we just, we just aren't there yet. Irene. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for the talk. Hi. It's great to see you. Um, I have two questions. Sorry, they're not retina related. I was just, I just noticed that in your, um, some of the experiments, there was mTOR pathway activation in the lens. What do you think the main function of that is? And the second question is, um, you know, given that the RP is pretty important, what are your thoughts on actually using things like PTU or genetic um, ablation of uh, RP um, kind of generation, you know, of preventing pigmentation essentially for experimental use in zebrafish for looking at other things like, you know, optical development or maybe lens physiology? Um, do you think it's actually not very, uh, very a very good way because you know the RP like the loss of RP is going to affect the whole eye. Yeah. So to answer your second question first, I think that's a really important one. So and to the non-zebra fish aficionados in the room, we often use a compound called PTU, which prevents pigmentation. And we do this that right the melanosomes along the body and within the RP or the, the, the melanin within the RPE just blocks the signal. So one could do this in a genetically albino background. That's a lot harder than just dumping this compound on. Um, but there's a number of studies that show that it, it kind of affects development and actually you know, somewhat buried in that data set I showed. If you look at the mTOR, or, 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 uh, PTU treatment actually activates the mTOR pathway really early in development. So that after a couple of hours of treatment, um, you actually see elevated mTOR without, you know, without anything else. So it's you know, the PTU is doing something there. And I think it's, you know, there are many cases I'm blanking on. I think it's thyroid hormone signaling. Alon Kahana has done some of this. Fai Young. There's a few people that have kind of looked at this. So I think it's a, a useful compound if you keep this caveat in mind and you start to carefully look at the times and make sure there's not a PTU component to this. Um, your first question with the lens, you know, yeah, we saw that. I haven't really thought about it too much that, you know, in this case, we were, we were focused on the RPE, but I, I don't know what it's doing. And I haven't looked that much in the literature to know what's there. I don't think there's much uh, published, but I, I just, we haven't looked at that for the lens. Thank you. Let's, let's, let's move to the list. She will unmute herself very soon. Yes. Sorry, I was having problems with the mute. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really excellent. Um, at the beginning, you were starting to talk about the fact that you were particularly interested in macular degeneration. And I was just curious, what do you think about the translatability of RPE ablation versus RPE degeneration? And yes. one of the things that really intrigued me was the fact that you see this stimulation of the immune response and of course, we, there's the thought that in terms of age-related macular degeneration, it's this ongoing immune response over decades that is potentially causing that degeneration. So what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, this is, this is a great question and something we've, we've thought a good bit about that, you know, there's, there's sort of this, again, we're doing this very acute sledgehammer-based approach, kill the cells, see whether they come back or not over a couple of days or a month in an adult. But I think the, you know, the immune system in the disease case, which is the relevant case, not the zebrafish eye case, um, you've got, as you say, this really prolonged immune response. And I think, you know, again, getting back to, to some of the literature and model systems, it's really this delicate balance that you have to be able to control that immune response. And I think animals like fishes and frogs and chicks to some extent, and you know, lots of other things, have ways of tipping this balance so you don't get this inflammatory cascade for very long that causes all the other problems, right? Fibrosis, all these sorts of things. You're sort of getting enough that stimulates some of these responses that then in addition, you have the capacity of these cells to either, you know, in the case of the retina, de-differentiate and, and sort of turn into stem cells or in the RPE, you know, maybe doing the same, but we don't know that. Uh, whereas in the human eye, right, you're just constantly sending these signals which are, are, are causing additional damage. We talked to 
um, we had a collaboration at one point we were trying to kind of develop something with a lab to sort of look at that and maybe develop more of a human type model. I know others are doing this too. Um, so I don't think I'm rambling a bit now, but I don't think our work necessarily can address that at all biologically in the human eye, but I think it shows that if there are ways to sort of move that immune response or modulate it quickly, you can potentially trigger, in addition, you know, with other uh, treatments, you can sort of trigger this, um, this survival response. I think one of the things for us, like realistically, are we gonna stimulate the human eye to regenerate RPE? <laughs> not very quickly, um, but could we use some of this to figure out how to keep a cell alive longer or to keep it, you know, maybe divide once? Like these, I think, are more realistic. And, you know, I think the estimates are anywhere from like 16 to 25 cones per RPE cell, right? So if you could preserve a couple of these or keep them going, or maybe the immune response quell it a little bit, I think that could have an immediate response. And realistically, that's where I think we can contribute in the short term. All right. Uh, I see that my friend Brian Perkins is extremely anxious to make a final <laughs> questions and comments. But before the last two questions coming from Sam and Dominique. Hi, Dr. Gross. My name is Sam and I'm an MD-PhD student working for Dr. Popchewski. I have two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, have you thought about ablating mTOR selectively in either the RPE or the mi uh, microglia macrophages? And uh, two, have you ever been able to induce the RPE to proliferate in any sort of weird ways? So like non-physiological ways? Um, so the first question, it's, a, it's a, a good delivery for you. Have I thought about it? Yes. <laughs> Is there any practical way to do it? It's much more difficult to do that sort of targeted approach. So we'd love to be able to do that, to manipulate it in one or the other. Um, but we haven't yet. We don't have the tools yet to be able to do that. So it's the, the target way. And then have we been able to make the RPE proliferate in any weird ways? In some of our CRISPR knockouts, I won't say proliferate in weird ways, we get weird morphologies of RPE cells, whether that's due to proliferation, whether it's through migration or not differentiating properly, not forming epithelial adhesions, I don't know. But we do see some weird morphologies and that's something we wanna follow up. Um, but beyond, I don't have any insight into why. So it's, again, a not very compelling answer, but it's, it's where we're headed. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Gross. This is Dominic from Chris's lab. Uh, two quick questions. Um, so you showed that in human pathological conditions, there could be some proliferation of RPE cells. And um, I was wondering, do you know what are the factors driving this uh, proliferation or is there any genetic de defect in these uh, uh, human uh, uh, patients? Um, and the second question, uh, are you aware of uh, anybody comparing transcriptum of uh, RP in uh, humans and zebrafish? So the second question is that yes, you know, many labs, or not many labs, a handful of labs are generating RPE sequencing data from various conditions. And, you know, with all the data sets out there, doing these comparisons are, are pretty easy. So the cells are very similar in, in transcriptomic uh, profiles between a, a fish and a human eye. And that's not just for the RPE. That's for all cell types. Um, but then starting to look at injured versus pathological conditions, that's where I think some of the analyses are being done now. Um, so your first question, I mean, I didn't show any human data here. So these were all uh, you know, just sort of examples from published studies. Um, so there's some, some work that's been published that, that you know, cadaver-derived RPE has the capacity and culture to proliferate and generate new RPE cells or mesenchymal-like cells. Um, so to me, I sort of use that more as a kind of a thought point that, okay, these cells, there's some constraint perhaps in the human eye that's preventing that. Is anything we learn maybe going to alleviate that constraint um, that they can do this in culture? But I don't know of any, um, you know, any, any I'm, I'm sure people are working on that, but it's not something we're, we're doing. And ladies and gentlemen, I give you now my friend Brian Perkins from <laughs> Hey, this Jeff. better be a good question, Brian. <laughs> nice talk. Um, I actually have two questions, One, I, neither of which I really think you probably have a really strong answer for, and that's great. It's just more thought-provoking conversation. Um, the first is when you ablate the RPE, you're killing the photoreceptors, and you didn't really go into this at all, but you kind of mentioned it briefly. 
does the absence of the RPE affect the kinetics of the rod or the photoreceptors to regenerate? And then the second question, I guess, is, and again, you kind of alluded to this early on, you don't really know the origin, but do you have thoughts on whether there's like a quiescent RPE stem cell that's present, or do you think it's transdifferentiation, you know, or where, I mean, where's your kind of gut leading you to on the origin of these, you know, or first proliferating cells? Yeah, and, and to answer the second question first, I mean, that's kind of been the bane of our existence lately is that, you know, generating these lineage tracing constructs, we've tried many different promoters and, or enhancers, many different types of, you know, flip this out, flip that out, Cree based, whatever. And we, we just can't get many of these to work. And, um, you know, we, we, we're sort of developing, I think we have some combinations now that may work um, to be able to label the cells. My gut feeling is that it's a de-differentiating RPE cell, right? These cells can do a lot, right? They're often multinucleate RPE cells. So they have the ability to, to divide without cytokinesis in, in mammalian systems. Um, so my gut feeling is that it's a de-differentiating cell, perhaps more than a, you know, a, a stem cell that's salt and pepper scattered throughout the RPE. That said, that's the sort of impetus for doing the single cell sequencing is that, you know, maybe at one or two, I remember having a conversation with Seth Blackshaw about this over a beer, um, you know, what's the lowest percentage with single cell sequencing you could detect a population if it in fact existed in the, in the RPE. Um, there we've just, as I said, we've had a hell of a time getting cell populations after we fax isolate them that we're comfortable with the viability enough to then be able to put on the 10x and do it. Um, so I don't have an answer for either of these, but my gut feeling is we're not, you know, if you look at other RPE data sets, I, I don't, I don't think there's going to be this sort of amazing, amazing, but this stem cell, it'd be great if it was there, but I think we're leaning more towards the de-differentiation side. As far as the first question, uh, Matt, let me just make sure I repeat it, was the you know, in the absence of RPE, do the photoreceptors recover? Is that what you're saying? It's more like in the absence, whenever the RPE is, you know, trying to regenerate itself and you don't have that trophic support, does that alter the kinetics at all of photoreceptor regeneration? I know that wasn't your focus, but I mean, did you see anything? And it might be easier to assess like in the adult, you know, paradigm too. Yeah, so we didn't, I mean, we didn't look at that directly. So I think any anything that follows is more anecdotal, but we always noticed, you know, the leading edge of the RPE would have photoreceptors that were starting to form outer segments, you know, X distance within that, suggesting that the RPE had to come first, of course, before the photoreceptors would undergo that morphogenesis. That said, it could have just been a time component that the photoreceptors are regenerating, and then it takes them some time to start to grow the outer segments, and the RPE has continued to regenerate in the um, orthogonal direction. Um, you know, we see photoreceptor regeneration pretty quickly derived from the Mueller glia when we do these BRDU assays, right? The, you know, the Mueller glia turn on instantly as the photoreceptors are dying. So I don't, not instantly, they turn on on the right kinetics. Um, you know, we didn't look at that carefully enough of, is it off by, you know, eight to 12 hours or something, I don't know, but it seems to be pretty normal. And these guys recover vision very, very quickly. And I think an under um, considered component of that is you still have these cells at the ciliary marginal zone, at least in the larval experiments that are churning out new photoreceptors. And you know, I've asked several people this, you know, how many of any given cell type do you need for vision? Right? How many photoreceptors do you need? How many ganglion cells do you need? These sorts of things. So we can get these very crude visual responses quickly, but I don't think that's you know, the same as functional vision. That's, you know, there's this giant shadow over me and I'm gonna get eaten kind of vision. Um, and, you know, these two are very, very different. Um, so I don't think we have a good answer because we haven't looked carefully at it, but my gut feeling is the kinetics are pretty similar um, in the RPE ablated case, um, at least based on some anecdotal stuff. Thanks. Right. I wanted to thank you, uh, yeah, Brian. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, just remember, next week uh, we have a final speaker before summer. Uh, it's going to be a, a great topic uh, on interface with uh, 
with uh, medicine. So this is a chairman of uh, Heidelberg uh, ophthalmology department. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. This is a great setup you all have. Thanks for including me. Thank <laughs> you.